Carl by Matt Dinneman. And this is uh, part two, which means we've read the whole book now. Some of us have read it twice. Me, Actually, this is my third time. I read it twice in the last two weeks just to kind of have it all down. It's th th three times for you, Vaden, or twice for you? Twice. Twice. It's a great book. Adam Vision says, are, are you the, the Maud of Maud's Book Club? God, I hope so. This is Zelda. Zelda um, went to the dentist. I dropped her off at 7 a.m. And she went under so that she could get a thorough teeth x-rays and clean and see where she's at. Turns out because she's already had seven teeth removed at two and a half thousand dollars before, they're like, oh, you've already done the preventative things. And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, well, we'll just give them a real good clean then. And I'm like, great. And they're like, it's still a thousand dollars. I was like, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. Anyway, there she is. She's a little bit groggy. Her tongue pokes out. She's cute. But good Lord. Brush your dog's teeth is the moral of that whole story. Um, Dungeon Crawler Carl is a bit of a different book. Uh, different in that its genre is game lit RPG. Uh, lit RPG is relatively new as a genre and it's kind of incorporating game mechanics and gaming styles and um, all of those. Oh, cats need, the cat's teeth needs brushing too, says Robin. Brush them kitty teeth too, especially donuts. We haven't had a... Ha Teeth brushed in here, just a fur brush. Mm. I might have to say something to Matt. <laughs> got to brush them teeth. Uh, is that the next T-shirt? We've got let them smooth and then brush them teeth. <laughs> brush them teeth before you smooch. There you go. Um, anyway, Game Lit. Lit RPG is very, very different. This is my first foray into Game Lit. Um, as a newer genre, it is sort of like, blending game mechanics, especially uh, role-playing games um, because role-playing and then building out the characters is like very, very easy to do. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm seeing new people join as well. Um, in the chat today, we've got Colleen, Aaron, Lisa, Thierry, Jimmy, Vaden, Avery, Nick, Robin, Kate, and Ken with more to maybe pop in. Uh, if you do want to be a part of the hi Komsky dude, I know it's Komsai dude, but I always just call you Komsky dude because I think that's a fun name. Uh, Overlord Light Novels has RPG mechanics in with a high fantasy setting, says Game Wizard 001. Oh, you go. <laughs> I know, it's just, I'm never going to change Komsky. I just think it's it looks cool that it's Komsky phonetically. Mm. Um. Lit RPG is what we're talking about. We've also got uh, different tiers of support if you want to support Moore's Book Club. One of them being you can join in the streams in a call. We're all in a call slash video conversation. It's like a little Zoom-esque type thing where I can see everyone's face and we're going to be chatting about the themes of the book. We're going full spoilers this time, so don't worry about... Um, if you've read ahead or anything like that, we're talking about the entire book. If you want to be a part of the show, you can head over to patreon.com slash Maud's Book Club. Uh, you unlock a bunch more of the Discord if you just become a member. Members, five bucks. You get all the mm, secret channels. You get double entries into giveaways. We've got a giveaway happening at the moment. We usually will try to have a giveaway at least month a uh, month or once was, was, was what I was going to say. Month. Month or once? Once a month. <laughs> once a month. Book giveaways, free books. How cool is that? Um, and I also try to get the author on to talk about the books. Now, because this these are quite easy, breezy reads and they're a lot of fun, I'm making Book Club read two books. Since we're halfway through the first one, we are talking about the first book, but next week everyone will be reading book number two, Carl's doomsday, doomsday scenario, you're up to, Tiri just goes, Tiri's up to book five. Tiri has burnt fingertips from reading so fast at this stage, but plus three to speed reading. <laughs> oh, yeah, listening, listening. That's right. <laughs> Aaron's like reading. And I'm like, yeah, true, listening. Um, what what speed are you listening on, Tiri? Do you listen at one? 1.2. That's where I started. 
I beat my record today. I realized that I was trying so hard to finish Dark Age uh, for Pierce's Q&A last night for Lightbringer in the Red Rising series, hoping to not have anything spoiled for me. Turns out that um, he goes, wow, that was the least spoiler q and I've ever done. And I was like, oh, cool. I, re- I read two books ahead, nearly, nearly two books ahead to not have anything spoiled. And lo and behold, nothing was spoiled. Um, it was a good little Q&A. If you follow Maud's Book Club on Instagram, you'll see the live stream of that. Ken, you popped on by. Thank you so much for that. That was awesome. Uh, you actually had a pun in there that made me laugh. <laughs> Real hard. What was it? The men, Mentos? Well, it was a ment. What was that? It was Ethos, the fresh maker, wasn't it? Mythos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was very funny. <laughs> I showed it to my friend. I was like, <laughs> that was good. Uh, Aaron says, I managed to listen to the audio book during work so I could get through it more quickly. Yes. Marty Deeks was there. Who's Marty Deeks? Is that a sports person? Well, that's the character that Aaron, uh, Eric Kristen Olsen plays on AS. Oh, I got it. Yeah, we only spoke afterwards about how Not Another Teen Movie was awesome and he was in that one. It was very, very funny. Colleen says, I read it at 1.7 and my sister couldn't believe that I could understand it. Colleen, I'm glad you're sitting down. I listened to it at 2.1. 2.1 today. Uh, Lisa was like, I think I listened to it 1.65. Yeah, that's, that's super casual. I was like, let's do this 2.1. And there were some characters that talk a little fast and I was like, Ooh, that's pushing it. Like that is pushing it. Um, but I just wanted to, um, get it finished for the second time. Cause I was a little bit behind this week. And I don't like being behind. Uh, let's talk a little bit about dungeon crawler, Carl. It's, uh, essentially Carl is your ex-Coast Guard nerd who's been stuck with his ex-girlfriend's cat when Earth is invaded by aliens and millions of people are forced into an intergalactic dungeon-crawling game show. Essentially, in a flash, every human erected construction on Earth, from Buckingham Palace to the tiniest of sheds to all the trucks and cars, collapse in a heap, sinking into the ground. The buildings and everything inside, including the people, have been... uh, atomized and transformed into the dungeon, an 18-level labyrinth filled with traps, monsters, and loot, a dungeon so enormous it encircles the entire globe. Only a few dare ev- ad- uh, venture inside, well, millions, but still. But once you're in, you can't get out. And what's worse, each level has a time limit. You have but days to find a staircase to the next level down or it's game over. And in this game, it's not always just about your strength or dexterity. It's about your views and your followers. It's about building an audience and killing those goblins in style. You can't just survive. You go survive big. Um, so that's that's what this book's all about. Now, I knew the majority of Maud's Book Club uh, followers would dig it. A couple I was uh, unsure about because I really do think you need to have played video games or appreciate video games to enjoy this sort of book. Now, Avery, you played D&D once, you've dabbled in video games, but you're not incredibly versed in RPGs. And you said that there just wasn't enough of an explanation to the system. There was a lot of assumptions about knowing with RPG and it hindered your reading experience just a little enough. Uh, I'd love for you to talk about that though, because for me, it was a duck to water having played RPGs my whole life. Um, But for you, it was just slightly, slightly off-putting. Avery, are you there? Yeah, um, yeah. it was like when it all started and then he just ended up and there was just words in front of his face and he was just like accepted it <laughs> and we were just supposed to just roll with it and then he went into the tutorial guild and uh, Mordecai's like, yeah, it's like a game. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> yeah, what do you mean it, by game? But... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, help me, help me. <laughs> And, like, the stats and everything, it was, like, he was, they explained how the stats were added, but not what they actually represented. 
And yes. which I didn't even really get until we talked about it last week. <laughs> Got it. Um, and this is the strength, intelligence, charisma, constitution, dexterity, all of those. You're right. There was an absolute assumption to these. So like I, I got like the gist of it, but I just was still kind of, I felt like I was still kind of behind where like Carl was in the understanding. Um, and yeah. I just kind of felt like excluded, I guess, from some of the parts. I started to get the hang of it more as I read more of it and, and after we talked about it last week. So I felt like I had a much better understanding in the second half. Um, but yeah, it was a bit difficult for me in the beginning. Yeah, and I think that's incredibly good feedback because it's like if I'm going to suggest this book to someone that isn't really a, a gamer or understands those sorts of uh, systems that are in place, I think feeling excluded is not a fun thing when reading, you know. It's supposed to feel incredibly inclusive where you're putting – in a first person as well where you are walking in this person's shoes – and if you're walking through the shoes, but you don't know sort of like how to tie the laces, that's a very different experience. Um, and, you know, yeah, it's like strength, you understand. Like strength, I don't think needs an explanation, but that's the one thing that Carl had. So he's like, yeah, strength? Yeah, I'm pretty strong. I work out. Like I'm a big guy. I'm 200 pounds. I'm six foot three. And so you're like, oh, thanks for the explainer on strength. Like we didn't need that. But constitution, like, I think Constitution kind of needs a little bit of an explanation of what that does. It's like, how will Constitution benefit me in any way? Like, that's the kind of thing that needed to be explained more. How come charisma is something that you need in a dungeon? Like, you know, if you're hitting a goblin over the head, where does charisma come into this? And I think that that requires a little bit more of an explanation. And I think with um, Donut's charisma skill level being so high, we start seeing the positive effects of how you can sort of manipulate the NPC characters and uh, what charisma can get you as well. Uh, I will say, because we only really have the two characters, we don't know the stats of the others very well, uh, except that Armani had a higher level, but we haven't really gone into their strengths and weaknesses per se. So we've only got two characters to get a full understanding of the scope of all the skill sets. Um, and that can be a little difficult. Um, Oh, Comsaidu said, uh, I just want to pop in and say, hi, I'm definitely going to make more of an effort to read books. Yay. If you need recommendations, we're here. And if you need a group of people to hold accountability and to hit a deadline when reading, that's that's us too. Uh, yes, I have an entire... Oh, do we not... Did more recs not work? We have... Uh... Oh, thank you for the follow too. Oh, I'm getting distracted. B4W8, thanks for the follow. Welcome to Maud's Books. I was going to say, welcome to Maud's bookstore. Uh, it's kind of true, though. Uh, if you go into bookshop.org, lists slash Maud's recommendations, I've got a, a two two different bookstores. One of all my recommendations are books that I've read and loved, and then all the books that we've previously done and are going to do for Maud's Book Club. Yay! Um, Aaron says, charisma in D&D terms is that you can intimidate someone, persuade them, deceive them too, as well as how entertaining you are. So yes, like with particular classes, like you heard Mordecai mention a bard class would be good for her. Bards use charisma for spellcasting, to entertain, to influence. And it's like a really important part. If you've seen the D&D movie with Chris Pine, like dude is charismatic AF. Like, he is so funny. His comedic timing is so good. I just want a little bit more height in my chair. There we go. Um, that's what charisma is, and that's what you can get away with a lot of the time. Uh, Bartleby Prime says, this was a great recommendation. It was very fun to read and surprisingly deep and well-written, given the relatively pulp novel cover and a shocking number of pastry references for a non-cookbook. Oh, are you talking about, oh, is that Doomsday Scenario? Teary, that's the cookbook? Or is that book four? <laughs> There's a cookbook in there somewhere. I just wondered if that's what we're talking about. Um, Kate says, I think they also didn't really explain the fact that charisma doesn't always mean that people like you. No, Donut can be a brat. Uh, and charisma to intimidate as well. Intimidation is not a likable trait to have. It's just that you hold influence. Um, and I do really want to talk about this notion of influence and integrity and how that Venn diagram, like what that Venn diagram looks like to some people. Um, can you influence with, with integrity? Or are you, is, 
is charisma and influence and getting ahead in this game, does it, does it come at a cost of integrity? Uh, that's a big thing I want to talk about. Kate says, cult leaders have high charisma, but they aren't nice people. A certain ex-president had high charisma, but he sucks. Charisma is about controlling people and situations for good or ill. Exactly. Uh, Buttery Prime just says, just a goddamn it donut reference. Yes. The such a... Did, uh, did anyone recognize the catchphrase before it was revealed? Or was it like a, oh yeah, it's been happening this whole time? No, Aaron says no. <clears throat> I had almonds just before. And they're kicking my ass, guys. Imagine going into the dungeon and being taken out by an almond that you ate. <laughs> that would be embarrassing. That is nuts. Eh, literally. Charisma can also inspire someone. Uh, yes. That would also be in probably the loot box. It's like, you have allergies. Well, we're going to give you the thing you can't eat. <laughs> yes. Uh, and yeah, manipulation is a really big thing here. Uh, and that's going to be a topic where it's like, yes, you're playing the game, but you're forced to play the game. But are you going to play with the game or against the game? Um, because they are they are the ones in charge, whether you like it or not. Hi, T-Bone. It's lovely to have you here. Um, oh, yeah. People saying, did you get the goddammit donut as a, as a catchphrase before? Aaron said no. Uh, Robin said, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, other people, uh, I think Kay Frito said yes. Uh, Next Issue says hi. Welcome, Next Issue. Um, KP Dubs, I did not get it. No, but as soon as he said it, I was like, oh, it's, it was right there. It was right there the whole time. All right, kicking off the second half of this book. Oh, wait, do we, did we rate book good? What did everyone rate this book out of five? Who wants to go? For, I'm going to go in my grid. Colleen, you are first. What did you give this book out of five? What did you like? What did you not like? What was your favorite character or moment? Um, I gave it a five. Um, I love the absurdity of it, uh, but I also love the game format. I think it's just, um, it's so much fun. Uh, there's so much humor to it, mm. but also some really poignant moments. So I just thought it was fun. Yay! And you were you were in the mood for a fun book this time, weren't you? You said you needed something a little bit light. Definitely. Yeah. Yes. That's a five from Colleen. Aaron, what did you give this one? I gave it five book goods out of five. Yay! I, kind of the same reason as as Colleen. It's like the humor was great. I you know being a video game just general nerd and all around you know the video game references. In fact, I did kind of call it from the original text and they reference it that it's running man but it's like so many other things in there mm -hmm. and just like the the D, D game elements to it all but then outside of the comedy it's like oh when the like serious moments hit you they hit you hard yeah. in this book <laughs> yeah i agree like surprisingly so where you're like i really i care about these characters Cause, real fast because there's it it reminds me of like this uh anime i i like to watch called Sword Art Online, where like a bunch of people got stuck in this deep dive RPG game, where it's like if your hit points run to zero, you're pretty much you're dead out. in the real world. So it's mm -hmm. kind of like Matrix style thing, except they can keep building their strings. The only difference is like you can go back to previous levels, unlike here, where it's like if you're basically out of the level, well, guess what? That thing's gone, and if you're still there while it's crashing, you're dead. Yeah, so. it, the pressure is immense in this one. Sword Art Online, I watched it and I thought I'd be really into it. And then halfway through that first season, it lost me. It had just, it had such a strong start. I was like, let's go. And then they had like some sort of weird adult child. And I'm like, what? Yeah. I was like, this was like season seven, frantic, what do we do this season kind of stuff that they'd fit in. In the first season that was my two cents anyway um but i like that i like that analogy uh kp dubs you gave it a five you said book good yeah, you said bug good, you said bug five. good <laughs> typo good Corey kills was here so i had to do a typo um i same same thing i enjoyed the the, the game references the D, D references and there was just enough sort of like mentions of like human things like Millions of people just died, you know, 
but I also have to keep going. I can't dwell on it right now. So, you know, there's some deep stuff that you got to get into, but mostly it was just reading page after page after page. Uh, it was so well done because you got swept up in the momentum as the reader. You're learning all of this information. You're kind of feeling yourself get, getting a bit excited about it all. You're like, cool, different weapons. And you can cut spells. And, a, and then it was like, um, you know, my mate Bob or whatever the mate's name is, was like, he was really dumb. He did this one double. Oh, my God, he's dead. They're all dead. Like, so he'll have these really grounding moments where – his reality, because, you know, his reality has been so distorted and changed and at such a rapid rate that the consequence of that, I think he hasn't processed and it pops up every now and then and, like, the the weight of it all hits him where he's just like, oh, my God, like, I'm never going to see this person again. Well, can't focus on that now. I've got to find new shoelaces. Oh, well, he has no shoes. <laughs> i got to find a new thing. Derbalicious says... <laughs> We got someone in here called Gerbalicious and they say, I love Dungeon Crawler Carl so much. Well, if you are a gerbil, uh, he loves you too. And he, he squished you with his foot. So tell us about that. Uh, Aaron says, this is one book I'm really glad to listen to the audiobook because of all the other voice characters. It is so good. It is so frightfully amazing. And the quality of my experience of the book, I reckon has doubled listening to it. Like, I'm just having such a good time listening to it. Um, Jimmy, you gave it a 3.5, 4 out of 5? Yeah, I gave it a 4 out of 5. Yes? Yes, 4 out of 5, correct. Uh, you know, a delightful book. You know, a lot of charm, charisma, whatever you want to call it. Yep. Uh, easygoingness. You know, uh, strong Jimmy got parts. a haircut, uh, everyone. I okay. did, yeah. yes. And that's why I'm extra handsome. <laughs> um, but uh, the reason why it, it I didn't like it. Is yeah, what because, was that one point that you docked from it? Well, you know, uh, generally nothing could be perfect, and um, overall, that's it's not true. I'm of, sitting in this chair. <laughs> Try again. Well, I'm glad that you feel that way. But this book, we're not talking about mod. This book. Why not? <laughs> is. <laughs> If you want it, if you want it, Maude, were you in this book? I don't know. Maybe you are. It's very possible you could be uh, one of the characters, maybe an NPC character. I don't know. But the um, but the reason being is that a lot of this stuff is very similar, like from anime, video games. Like for example, Persona. Persona is very similar to this book. Yep. Where you have to, you have a certain time limit, all that stuff. But overall, good book. Hold on. So why did you duck the point? I just told you. Yeah, I didn't it's hear it. A lot it. of predictable, a lot of predictable story, you know, like stuff. Got know, it. Got it. Again, similar. To I I hear you now. Um, because it is a lit RPG, it is leading lending itself into a lot of tropes and, you know, familiarity. I guess you could say, and that familiarity became a little predictable. Okay, I like that. Yeah. Oh, it's lit, all right. Terry, you gave it a seven out of five. Yep, like last week. I saw that comment that you just made, Thierry. Um, Lucia Ma does not have a personality. I could never be Lucia Ma. She has two dogs. I have a sedated That's dog why... right now. I have one very heavily sedated dog. <laughs> hey, baby. And. And since she's the only character in the dungeon with dogs, that's why I said, oh, no, Mod is not the character with dogs. Well, we found out as a throwaway comment, um, there's a woman who has goats. Yes. Her whole flock of goats is in there. I could be goat girl. Maud, stop making it mm. all about you. I'm like hearing myself. It's like Donut was like, oh, even she kind of understood that she was being annoying. I'm having that Donut moment right now. What would you do if you gave Zelda a biscuit and she could suddenly talk and was more intelligent? We kind of spoke about this a little bit last week where it was yes, like... Yes, Princess Mononoke. Yeah, yeah. And I'd be like, I really hope that, like, it would be nice. She would say nice things. And someone said, like, Zelda would know all the wonderful things. Because I was like, would she stay in my group or not? Or would she just be like, peace, Maud? You're like, 
good luck, bitch. And I'd be like, Zelda, no. <laughs> and someone commented saying, no, Zelda would know all the wonderful things you've done for her over the years and she would stick by you. And I was like, hmm. Yeah, that was me. <laughs> it was you, Vaden. It was you. Oh, it was so <laughs> cute. It was so sweet. And I was like, oh. <laughs> Um, but probably also remember all the embarrassing moments where you like you know have her holding up on, <laughs> on screen where she doesn't want to. Yeah, yeah. That's the thing though. She'll be the absolute antithesis to Donut, whereas Donut's like preening herself, being like my best angle. So Delta would be very much like Carl, being like I don't want to do this, I don't care. And it's like, ah, oh, no, Zelda, Zelda, we we need all the help we can get. Like play the game a little bit. And she's like, nah, I don't give a shit. Not my problem. <laughs> Uh, B Rock Vandal, thank you so much for 16 months in a row. Appreciate that one. You've subscribed for 20 months too. Zell would be like, Yeah, where's that Hector guy? He was cool. I'm like, <gasps> <laughs> uh, Dogs are generally more loyal than cats, says Colleen. Yeah. Just two, two bitches in the dungeon. Ah, oh, that sounds terrible. Don't clip just that. <laughs> <laughs> oh no Barbary Prime says I love that Carl almost becomes the animal companion and donut and all cats never saw it any other way <laughs> yeah this is my personal bodyguard and he's like what <laughs> are you kidding um oh, who was so Terry what, what are your favorite things about it who's your favorite character you gave it a seven out of five uh okay so not going forward for the first book would be uh princess donut would be my favorite character in book one mm -hmm. okay you're like it will change later on yeah he's like and in book two it was this and in book three it was this and in book four it was that yeah we when Terry starts something that he likes oh, yeah about book five today uh, starting tomorrow uh, book six audio comes out September 1st. So you're actually good timing. Well, no, you're actually you're going to be way ahead of schedule. Uh, and favorite, well, I, I would say my favorite part of book one would be uh, the feral gerbil because it reminded me of a scene in uh, season two of The Boys where they have a soup hamster that flew and basically got into the mouth of a mercenary and uh, ate their way out of their head yeah yeah it's true and i just just clicked that yeah so uh i, I could easily imagine how the the fight with the gerbil would look like <laughs> it's like the way that it went rah, like i could see that it's this thing it's like really visually well written so that you can like it's very immersive language how he writes i think um People are talking about their favorite characters. Of course, you would, Kate. We'll get to that for sure. Um, KP Dub says, if I was a D&D &D character, I'd be proficient and have advantage on animal handling checks. They all love me. Oh, that's so funny. Um, Aaron says, I'm sad that no one did a clever girl comment when the raptor was revealed. Don't worry, we have our own clever girl here. Mm. Shout out to Colleen one time. Um, Vaden. Five out of five. Second time through reading this, though, did you take take anything new from it since the last time you read it, which was like not even a year ago? Okay, so like, um, I think this time I focus more on like what Carl and everyone else is doing outside of the game itself, like then like the, like, the, like the more like meta narrative of like not just the, him trying to survive in the dungeon, but also like the like the sh in the interview shows and like the other stuff like that outside of it, like the whole drama regarding the, like the the boy uh, or the the born um uh corporation and and the valentin uh, uh, yeah valentin i can't remember valenti i forgot uh, valve it. valve something the valtec so, yeah, valtec valtec sorry valtec yeah exactly yeah so all this stuff especially with you know agatha especially because like the last time i kind of just kind of glossed over that i i noticed it in some minor degree but i didn't really think about it and this time now I'm watching, I'm listening to it again. Like I never been noticing a lot more how much how many clues were given about like, or how many how much, or basically how how much you learned about it. This is the first book alone. I have two actually. Now that I've read more and I know what happens, there are things where I'm like, huh, very clever. Like the first read, you don't know, and then the second read, you're like, hmm, this is a really bit of a big deal right now. Uh, prices, 
prices. Thank you so much for the follow. Welcome to Maud's Book Club. We're covering Dungeon Crawler Carl, a lit RPG um, book by Matt Dinneman, which is very, very funny. And we're talking all spoilers this time because we've finished the book as a group. And we're going to be moving on to book two next week. Uh, if you want to, oh, it's getting hot now. If you want to get involved in the book club, um, B Rock Vandal says, I also, oh no, it was Oddball, sorry. Oddball says, I do love some of the descriptions, like, scroll up, a psychotic Wolverine hopped up on bath salts. It's like, yep, like you've got a visceral image of that one. Like it is just right there. But it's again, it's like quite clever. It's very funny. Um, Avery, you gave it a 3.5 out of 5 and you've got very valid reasons in doing so and I'd love to talk through them because we're talking about these descriptions, the imagery, the humour and sometimes humour can be a little hit or miss and you're saying that there's particular jokes in here where it just kind of goes a, a little bit too hard with it and you're just like, okay, we get it. Talk me through your 3.5. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a lot of what I was talking about earlier with the, like, not being as descriptive for people who aren't in games and stuff and it, it's like assumptions the assumptions that it makes um but then also yeah some of the humor just didn't work for me not all of it like some of it was really funny mm -hmm. but then some of it i was just like okay that feels a little unnecessary yeah um yeah so did you listen or read i read it Okay, I'm glad you didn't listen to it because, like, the one joke that you didn't like, oh, hi, academic. The one joke that you didn't like uh, that gets mentioned and mentioned a lot is that the AI is basically fetishizing Carl uh, and his feet. And, you know, in the description, it's like the AI has a very different take on how he speaks. Well, the narrator <laughs> goes above and beyond to deliver that um, creepiness and... Uh, it's, it's it's yeah it go yeah, yeah. <laughs> i would i would not enjoy that <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah um but it's again for me it's like really interesting to see what happens when they take all of hum earth's humanity uh with references with culture with what happens and it's like you know we go into level two where there are little miniature karens or you know all these sorts of things who they're not going to speak to the management they are management the manager uh but like little things like that where it's like it, it takes things and foot fetishes there it's the internet if they can fetishize it they will but it's interesting and i kind of appreciate the fact that not even carl who is the six foot three white dude is immune to being fetishized uh, that's like kind of how gross the earth is. Ha ha! <laughs> Yay! Um, but I hear you on that one. Aaron said, did we just start a meth war with goblins and llamas? He said that was so unexpected. I had to pause quickly due to so much laughing. Yeah, it, it has an outrageousness behind it, which is a lot of fun. The AI reminds me of Claptrap dialed up to 11 from Borderlands. Uh, yes, Tiri says, don't look up the cover of book four. There you go. STS says even more proof that AI is evil. KP Dub says the Crack Karen was a great name. Mm, that's true. Um, B Rock Vandal said, did anyone double dip like me? I listened and read about 50 50. Oh, that's cool. I should buy it. I should buy it. I want to support Matt. Um, oh, that just reminded me. We're going to be doing a giveaway. <laughs> I need to organize the details of that. Da, 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 da. New achievement! <laughs> Maud had a task that she thought about live on air and now has to write it down, otherwise she'll forget. And she's a slow writer. Got it. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, who we got next? Nick, Black Belt. What did you give this one out of five? Uh... I gave it a five, yeah. What it's, did you like about it? It was really fun. What was fun your favorite movie. moment or character? Uh, it, you know, I didn't, originally I wasn't planning on reading this, but I'm glad I picked it up. Uh, I think, you know, it's just like a fun adventure type read, like they said before, it's, it's, you know, uh, it's kind of light, but it also has like depth to it that I'm finding more and more. And I think that also kind of balances that really well. Thing, so. I like that you decided to take a chance on it and it paid off. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, Yay. yeah, me too. Are you listening yeah. to it or reading it? Ah, uh, reading it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm just looking up show chat as well. I'm um, just making sure everyone can hear everyone. Possibly using a browser or the desktop app is going to be helpful for others. I uh, just wanted to make sure that everyone knew about that. Um, five is a good one. Uh, Kate, did I see you gave it a four? I had originally given it a four, but then after I had finished reading it, I kept thinking about it more and more. So I actually raised it up to a five. What were some of the things that you couldn't stop thinking about? particular just the whole vibe and I was like kept because I haven't started reading the second one yet because I like to do it closer to when we're going to talk about it mm -hmm. and I was just like oh, I can't wait to read the second one and I just like you know was just thinking about I wonder what's gonna happen with like how Carl and Maestro now have this kind of like royal civil war thing going on and what's Agatha's deal so I raised it up because it stayed with me. Yay. Oh, that's so cool. I like that. I've done that before. I've gone, that's a solid four. And then I still found myself six days later, just like the characters would pop up or I'd have that like feeling of just like, oh, I wish I had more of this, you know, and I've had to adjust it afterwards. I like it. Like it then when it happens. I like it when that happens. Terry says that's why I couldn't stop. Uh, Aaron says it was Agatha all along. We're young and we're talking about Agatha. Absolutely. Uh, last but not least, we got Robin. What'd you give this one out of five? Was it a four? Nah, five. Five. <laughs> no, five. <laughs> we have a talking cat. Five, 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 five. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. uh, is that your favorite part of it or what were some other standouts? Um, yeah, I mean, Donut is definitely my favorite character. Uh, and, and my favorite something. part. Yeah, yeah, my favorite part would have to be when she gets Mangu. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Mo yeah. Donut has gone from... You know, you are my bodyguard and I'm in charge uh, and you must dote on me, Carl. And, you know, everyone must think and respect me to becoming like big mum energy, like show mum energy where it's like, this is my child and I will make sure that I love it unconditionally. So it was like a really beautiful um, sort of change to Donut's character. But I mean, the overarching thing is Donut just wants to be in a position where she's in absolute control. She craves control. Um, and Amanda Tess says, yes, the nose chomping was so cute. I love that whole part. Uh, very, very cute. Okay. So, um, it sounds like on average it's about a 4.5. Lisa, you gave it a four and a half. Yeah, I did. Um, I really enjoyed it. I, th it, I think it was hilarious. I, I don't know if I would have, um, given it, I don't, didn't give it a five cause I don't think I would have loved it as much if I had read it physically as listening to the audiobook because I think the audiobook was what made it for me but now I liked it did a lot. you listen to Dresden Files with um it did yes what's his name I can't believe I'm James blanking Mars thank you Marsters. I've just got brain fog today I've I've underslept two nights in a row and I'm now currently in sleep debt and I'm feeling it uh I think the... you missed the, the sheer dread or shock oh, I saw that it. Sherry just gave I saw it <laughs> I saw it completely his head snapped up so fast with blazing eyes and I was like can you just tell me who it is I know you'll know it Ugh. um so hold on do you think that Jeff Hayes does a better job than um what's his name um, don't be mad at me, but I, I think he did. <laughs> like, I, do I, too. Love, I love the Dresden audiobooks, but just because I love him so much, yes. I think like, but he's, he's not like my top tier audio narrator. So I think that Sorry, <laughs> sound booth as a production studio has done such an amazing job. I, I, whether this Jeff Hayes is just a godsend, who's one of the most talented people to do voice characters and scenarios and just like and character acting like he brings these characters to life he understands the words um like you have to understand like as a voice actor there's so many different ways you can say every single sentence but you have to place intent or response or reaction and he's given every single character such distinctness um that it's genius it is genius level and i can't actually i'm going to talk to matt dinneman about that big time because it is just so wonderful uh, academic you've been listening to them as well you're an audiobook fiend how did you rank uh dungeon crawler carl out of five 
it's, I have a sickness though. So I, as soon as I start one, uh, regression based book it's hard to you know, like stop the train until they're did you just say you have the sickness <laughs> yeah when it comes to a lit rpg it's very difficult to stop once you start for me anyway so so where are you um, up to then i i stopped but that's only because uh, a different lit rpg book series that i've been listening to came out with book 10 so book I, 10. I stopped to listen yeah like some of these go hard it's crazy um, how did Dungeon Crawler Carl um, fit in with sort of other lit RPG out there? Um, it's much better. I think Matt Dineman has much better prose than most people who are writing lit RPG, which is primarily um, like only a slight tier above fan fiction for most lit RPG. Right. To be completely honest. So, so uh, Matt Dineman has done a much better job. It, it, it's He goes a lot. He makes his characters a lot more deep i'll say um he, he it's a lot more thought provoking i mean you have this much more layers of depth to the mm -hmm. characters and a dungeon crawler crawl than most of the rpgs uh robin said i got my husband to listen to dungeon crawler carl he just finished i asked him what his rating is out of five he said i don't have a rating system just that i will continue the series which is high praise from him uh, i got my brother darcy into the series darcy are you watching on the side are you are you lurking brother I got him to read it because I actually think he would be a great lit RPG author. He is practicing writing. He's writing a bunch of fantasy books at the moment um, that have been not appraised, but like he entered into a writing competition and the feedback was very positive. Um, and so we're kind of taking next steps with that. But I know my brother and I know for a goddamn fact he's going to love Dungeon Crawler Carl. But because he's been writing so heavily, Darcy, if you're there, pop on in. I want to chat with you because he has some – incredibly astute observations with writing now he hasn't finished the book he's only on like chapter seven or something but i got like maybe i can bring it up his rundown of the first couple of chapters he thinks that um the way that matt dinneman set up the first chapter with all the events because by chapter two you're in the dungeon and he was like I was in awe of the speed in which this all unfolded. Um, and uh, oh, can't you, can't you be big? Can't you be, can't, can't I make you big text? Hold on, I'm getting old now. Open in messenger. Okay, cool. I'm going to read out his play by play on this book. Cause I got him audible for his birthday. Um, that's not an ad audible. Give me money. God damn it. God damn it, Amazon. All right. Um, so he says, I've done one and a half chapters. I like it so far, Incel Goblins. <laughs> and he goes, I'm thinking about all the literary techniques uh, constantly. The most important thing in the exposition was his smoking. There's no world, but the story is boom. Like Ready Player One, we know what to do from the start. The world for him is tiny though, which is good. It's a good plot so far. He did a lot of small things in the first chapter. It's very balanced. His aim is to get sympathy for Carl. He was in the military, but only for a bit. Then as the Coast Guard. If he was a Marine, we might lose sympathy because we expect him to do well. But he's got some skills, which is good because he was in the Coast Guard, uh, which will help people with the sympathy. He doesn't like cats, but he's looking after a cat. Sympathy. He smokes in the house only because his ex didn't like it, but he still opens the window for the cat. Sympathy. Um, he is not an asshole, but he is cheeky. And that's the combo that you want for perfect sympathy. He isn't dressed for it all because he was doing something nice. Sympathy. Uh, you need that perfect balance for a good start. But I bet he wrote that first chapter heaps. It's all stuff that the reader glosses over and doesn't think about, but it works. Also, it's important that the pop-ups aren't mean. They are funny, but they're not mean. He's getting rewards because of his situation, not because they're being mean to him. Uh, we want to think that the caverns are a fun way to live, not a grueling test, so we want more. So, yeah, I'm reading... Uh, I like it, but I'm thinking about all this stuff as I'm reading. I had to go back like four times. Um, but he like had a few suggestions for it saying the whole patrons and viewers things that could have waited. We don't need to know that in the initial exposition because it doesn't mean anything until level three. Could have been done later. Loot boxes in the inventory um, and everything was still fine. The first battle should have been resolved fully 
There shouldn't have been a way out for him. He should have won it by himself desperately. And then another lot should have come along and then done the tutorial. And then what he learned from the tutorial, he goes out and destroys them. The guild shouldn't have broken up that first fight, but the second should have been a harder one. So it's like really interesting hearing all of his feedback um, from it in that in that particular way. Because I'm not reading this with like a check mark of all the reasons and ways I like Carl. But I just, you know, the first chapter into the book, I'm like, I like this guy and I want to, I want to be in, I'm in this with him. But for him to kind of spell out like all the, the small little things that he's done to make Carl likable. Cause I remember last week I was like, is Carl likable? Why is he likable? And he's my brother spelling it out for me, um, completely with like this checklist. Anyway, I thought that was really interesting. Uh, I'm going over a bunch of comments that I've just missed, so I'll get there. Kate says, to be fair to fan fiction, while there's a lot of crap, there's still some really great stuff mixed in there. Uh, didn't Andy Weir start off kind of like, not fanfic, but he was self-publishing on a blog and someone goes, dude, this is the best thing I've ever written, like write the book. And then he wrote The Martian. <laughs> Well done, bud. Uh, Kate said, one thing we talked about last week was praising Matt Dinneman for not sexualizing female characters. And I want to praise him again for his description of the crab lady's boobs because it felt like meta commentary on how most male authors, especially in genre fiction, go nuts describing boobs. And he was using that to be completely ridiculous. And I thought it was fantastic. I also, um, in listening back to it, he never called it a boob or a tit. He only ever, or Carl, Carl only ever said that they were breasts, but he was just like, this is so ridiculous. And this is like, so over the top. He goes, is this what people want? Because it is not even functional. Like it is not, he, he, yeah, you're right. The way that he was talking about it, it's like, it, that's like one of the hosts. And then you've got this other host who is just in incel fodder you know his audience at 11 12 year old boys and he's calling them sea bombs and he's getting them to chant and worship him and it's he's basically brainwashing this audience to perpetuate cruelty so you're right it's really easy to see sort of like how matt is expanding this world um but it's sort of like such an exaggeration on humanity and the pockets of kind of like ugh, things that we have but to the nth degree um okay Frida said yeah Matt Dinneman did so good with the start of the book um KP Dub says yeah it was like page one let me tell you about myself I am Carl page two roll for initiative <laughs> yeah it was in it Lisa says I was thinking about our talk when that scene started and I was cracking up uh, S3 Prototypes just followed. Hello, bud. Says, I missed you since the source fed days. Welcome. I do a book club called Maud's Book Club. Uh, in true nerd fashion, it's sci-fi and fantasy. Uh, we meet mm, a few a few Wednesdays every month. This week, it's every Wednesday. <laughs> Read the books. Come join and chat with us. Uh, Academic says, I'm not sure if we can talk about the Patreon's followers later. They are a huge driving force for Donuts Motivation. Yes. The first half of the book, it's like, Followers, zero. Viewers, zero. You know, all that kind of stuff. And then by the end of the book, it's views, 478 billion. And you're just like, what? <laughs> like this number is just incredible. And we are now experiencing the vastness of what's out there. And it's all spotlight on, on this sort of moment on earth in this dungeon. And it's one of however many it's gone through. So it's like, the scale that we are now experiencing. It's like, oh yeah, one single planet Earth did not matter at all. Um, Kate says, I actually like that he got into the Patreon info first because RPGs are like that. You get info that you don't need right away or ever. Avery says, I agree about the patrons thing. I felt like it was getting so much information, but not the information I needed. Interesting feedback. I kind of love that people are like, yes, I think it's important. Other people are being like, no, not yet. Too much, too fast. That's really fascinating. Um, and Avery said, to be fair, which that's how I also felt playing D&D. So <laughs> yeah, the first time you play D&D with a rule book, a player's handbook, <laughs> I just start saying, I'm just going to tell you what to do. And they're like, thank you. Thank you. It's like, yeah, it's a lot. There's no way you can understand all of it. Uh, B Rock Vandal says, Carl not hesitating to help people he doesn't even know, says it all. K Frito says, it's an interesting tease with all the social media for later. Mm -hmm. um, 
KB Dub says he says that her back would snap like a twig with those. Yeah, like ana at anatomically, it doesn't even make sense. Um, Aaron says, remembering our reading of the magician and the absurd description the author used. It yeah. It's like if you're getting pervy and creepy on your characters, yeah. To quote Charlie Theron to me, you need to take care of a few things and then get back to this. Uh, Academic says, so true. I loved reading lots of fan fiction. I'm talking about fan fiction, but I feel like the majority of it was wish fulfillment writing without much technique. A very few real gems though, uh, which is like my favorite kind of thrift shopping. Um, Miss Necromancer says, what voice did the voice actor use for Maestro in the audiobook? It would have been funny if he'd done a high-pitched wiener like Ben Shapiro. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm Maestro. This is what I sound like. Is You know, the big orc thing. Is that about right? Did I get it? No. Academic says that's actually not so good. Yeah. Um, but it, yeah. He's like, listen here, you little shitheads. He said that's a bit better. My little piglets. Suck on that. <laughs> it is so, it's so disgusting. That whole maestro moment was just gross. I'm going to go through the book in chronological order because I took some notes. Um, but that was the answer to that. Game Wizard says it feels like Dark Souls. You either get a lot or none at all. And the only way to find things out is through item description. And you cannot skip tutorials. <laughs> KP Dub says in RPGs, you often have some sort of NPC who sends you on a quest and gives rewards. Patrons are kind of like that. Um, academic. Oh, it's a gruff pig like voice. Yeah. Terry says the magician is one of the rare occasions that the TV show adaptation is better than the books. Yeah. Um, KP Dub says. Glurp, glurp. <laughs> Kate says, Maestro totally has a tactical bath. <laughs> um, oh, they're saying it's like a piggy Alex Jones. Game Wizard says, I can't wait for the Maestro to die. He is the worst. Okay, yes. Um, again, Matt Dinneman definitely makes you, like he is manipulating us, the audience, in really, really clever ways. Now that my brother's like pointed it out, because I was like, I like Carl. Carl's great. Donut's a lot of fun. I love Donut. And then it's like, but... I, you know, I don't love, and I think one of the big moments, I'm going to skip ahead and just get to it. Um, in my second listen to the second half of this book, it was interesting when Jack, the elderly man who ends up summoning the rage elemental by urinating in the, the passageway. Um, the f We don't really know much about this guy, except he's like a little bit incoherent. Um, but he says something creepy, pervy right before it happens and i in the second read through went oh we're supposed to not like jack we had this one little moment that made us dislike him as a character and then he goes and does this and so the emotion we are made to feel is absolute outrage at him doing this because he's you know we found out from brandon he's been explicitly told he is incredibly aware that this is something to not do anymore because there will be severe consequences. And then he says something pervy and then he goes ahead and does it anyway. And Amani is it? oh, Yolanda has to shoot and kill him, you know, to try and save them all. Doesn't work. Interestingly, outrage at his actions. It's like, and what does he summon? A rage elemental. So it's almost harnessing our emotions and that's the monster that's summoned in that moment. I thought that that was quite interesting. KP Dub says, outrage for his actions, but apathy for his death. Because he was senile, but it was this, like this, yet again, a reminder that every single person in this dungeon is a liability. And when these people are older than 90 and you tell them not to do something and that's not enough, they are, it's, it's a dire situation. And again, it plays on this whole, what should you do? And this is, this is RPG at its finest. You go into a corridor. There is an old man who looks like he's about to urinate to summon, you know, and will summon a rage elemental. What do you do? And I've just been playing a lot of Baldur's Gate 3 at the moment. And you're put into situations where you're like, I don't know what to do. If it was Maud, I'd be like, this ain't my fight. You know, I don't really want to have... Uh, a say in this because this seems like it's got a lot of history and I'm just a new person walking on in. But some of these things would be like, 
um, there have been refugees coming in uh, because there's been a lot of goblins sort of like in the uh, killing around. And so these tieflings are finding refugee, but then it's like, but they're disrupting sort of like our, our harmony and we want to get rid of them to sort of do our own thing. But then the druid would like try to kill a kid and you're like, okay, we don't kill kids here <laughs> unless you or me in the first playthrough. Um, and then so you're really, really torn about what to do. And I think this moral compass is so well done in the second half of this book where it's like no one wants to be in the dungeon, but we have a bunch of senile people that cannot take care of themselves. And it's like we either have to take care of them or leave them behind or there is a third option that Maggie Mai and Frank Q would have done, which is kill them and take their experience. Like these are all options in this game because it's not a game, it's, it's life. Uh, anyway, I mean, from Jack's perspective, the urination was a nice out. Pun intended. God damn. The druids suck. A fair bit of casual racism in BG3, which is why I didn't side with them. And I had to kill the druid. I had to, I killed the druid, the lead. Because we don't do racism. And then they shut. I don't know what happened in my game. They shut me out anyway. Um, Jack was the number one problem. First time Chatter... Uh, Jethro says, I've been doing a lot of things, but judge an eight one. <laughs> um, hat do kill them. Mm. Okay, so let's go through other things. Here are my notes for the show. Uh, I would love everyone to weigh in on them. Um, the first one, we see how addicted to fame Donut is. You've just been on a show with Odette. Odette, who is a longtime player who's climbed the ladder to have her own incredibly successful show, who has some sort of sordid history with Mordecai. She was his trainer. And then they had a huge falling out, and we don't really know why. And Odette's trying to make up for it, but Mordecai wants nothing to do with it. So there's like a lot of tea happening here. Um, but the big thing that we saw with Donut is even before the show she's like what's the angle what is the audience like am i better off going fun and cheeky or taking this more seriously da, 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 da. and she's working it and da, carl's just like what and then it's like i've got this follow my lead so to see donut be able to take charge with this was really interesting but this is in her element yes k frito she's a show cat this is her entire life and this is where we see her personality and her backstory really come to life uh she is a professional she is on she gets the biz baby um odette also drugged donuts treats for the show really is that what happened no yeah they talk about it after the interview um all of a sudden donut starts walking into the t holographic wall and is like this room's all up smaller than it seems. And Carl kind of looks at Odette and is like, so what'd you guys do? And she's like, oh, it's just something in her treats. It raised all of her stats by like one and a half. It's kind of like having a wine before you go on the show. Right. Got it. I missed that. She's a boss cat. Um, B-Rock Vandal says, I'm interested to see what happens when Donut meets the crawler with two dogs. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> well, I know. <laughs> um, Clever Girl says, I think the people who just stayed in the Waffle House until Collapse had the easy way out. Yeah. Um, Terry says a sentient show cat. Of course, she would jump on the showboat and then social media in a toxic way. It's kind of like new influences. Uh, Oddball says wisdom boost is in the treats. Um, so we're, we're seeing the positives of Donuts show cat heritage coming to play. And it can be really, really helpful because Carl doesn't get it at all. Uh, but we're also seeing the negative effects. And Terry, you kind of said this as well. Like she's she's getting on board with this in a toxic way. I want to talk about the strengths and weaknesses of um, Donut in this instance because, A, we are recognizing and realizing it's a very necessary part, uh, how many numbers you have, how many followers you have, how you can manipulate and orchestrate sort of things going your way as well and being likable is super important. What are the negative parts of this? Who wants to talk through negative implications of this new toxic, famous academic show cat? Yeah, obviously she seems to be caring, like very cat-like behavior, I guess. Uh, but she she has a very um, 
self-centered attitude, which which is to be understandable. Like it's it's not she's not just only a cat, but she's also kind of a child. Like she just gained sentience, and yeah. she's still processing years of like, okay, whoa, this is what all of those different things were, and this is how I'm what those things meant, and this is how I'm actually supposed to react. So I think we're seeing both. Uh, her coming to uh, understanding of like her own sentience and, and how she's supposed to interact with other people as well as like you know she, she's, she's just a little toxic maybe because she's a cat but you know there's, there's just something there that uh, she may grow out of or she may not you know so that's where I hear you with that you. Kate says when you live and die by the likes oh no when you live by the likes you die by the likes uh, KP Dub says, when Donuts checking views during a fight, that is an issue. That is a negative consequence as well. Avery says, influencers tend to put themselves in varying problematic slash dangerous situations to keep their views up. This is what's really interesting about being in television. Um, there was like, in another world, there is a mod who had an a, a trickle of the integrity that I possess. And that mod is one of the best reality TV producers ever <laughs> because to do that you really have to have like no integrity no moral compass because the the most important thing that's good television we made entertainment and this entire dungeon is about as many views to get as much money and so you have to go to all these extremes you've got a show called death watch where they will pluck crawlers out when they're in a near death uh, situation to basically mock them, to be cruel to them, to, to choose and to put them in horrible situations for the sake of entertainment. And that triggers Carl completely because his integrity is sky high. And I think that's going to be good because Donut's integrity is a little wish-washy. And I think that having those two together will be important to balance. Uh, Aaron, your hands up. You got talking points for this one? Yeah. Um, I know it was like mentioned by Mordecai like the very towards the very beginning when he's like talking with him the first time about it's like how it's more like running man and that they looked at all the like culture and movies and references of stuff. But I don't know if you ever watched the movie Running Man, but the whole premise is is basically they got a bunch of guys who need to be executed, whether they're political prisoners or actual prisoners, but they basically have them in this very stylized, televised way basically think American gladiators, but, you know, so like you come across like these very specific, you know, guys who are supposed to be executioners and you have to like overcome them and then you can move on. If you get to the end, you win and you can basically get a pardon. And it's like, it, it's like this book took that plus hunger games. Cause you have to like work the crowd, like people, the audience watching, cause then you can get sponsors, you can get more valuable items sent to you. And the people who don't have that kind of thing are going to have a harder, harder time. Squid and games. If, yeah, that too. And also I'm thinking, and it hasn't been introduced yet, but I would be surprised if, like, if you're, like, so, like, low in views and the people just hate you so much, they may then and just invest in the people who also hate you in the game, the other crawlers, so that they have an advantage against you and make it more difficult for you in that regard as well. Because now you don't, not only do you not have resources, but now your enemies have the resources you could have had, had you just been more entertaining. So I get why Carl doesn't like it, but Donuts got the good idea, at least, that this is for our benefit. You may not like the game, but you better learn how to play it or you're going to die. <laughs> it's the learning how to play it to stay alive, but not, but getting, also, not getting so con consumed by it that it'll kill you. mantra of like, it will not break me. I won't let it break me. It's like that mantra he just keeps doing. And that's, mm, sorry, these were the chocolates that Vaden got me. <laughs> I was like saying, I was like, Vaden, is that chocolates? And there's one that's like a, mm, mm. what is it called? The almonds when they're like roasted? Yeah, roasted almond. It's a roasted almond chocolate one in there. Um, his mantra is fantastic. And I love hearing it from his point of view. Because he's like, he, he recognizes and understands that this is a game. He understands that like the game is keeping him without pants. It's making sure that he has no shoes. It is fucking with him. And so he repeats to himself, you will not break me. So you can keep making this agony for me. You can keep putting me through the ringer with this, but you will not break me. And I love that as a grounding point for him.
because it does keep him in reality and it keeps him fighting with a purpose. And I said this last week, if you don't have a purpose in a game like this, then you're in Waffle House, you know. You're in Waffle House waiting for, waiting for everything to squish down. Battery Prime says, to be fair, Donut doesn't have pants either. That is really important. <laughs> KP Dub says, let's face it, Carl needs the skills that Donut has and Donut needs the skills that Carl has. They actually complement each other really well. They do. They do. Running Man by the, by the great Richard Bachman. Mm. Uh, that whole death watch when Carl meets Maestro face to face, he is going to punch him into next week. <laughs> mm. But it is interesting, like going to your point, Aaron, as well, where it's like, if people don't like you, they can make it harder for you. But it's like, we are also seeing just how big this entire galactic civilization is. And no matter who you are, there is someone who will like who you are. So if you're playing really dirty and rough, Maggie Mai killed her own daughter, is so fueled with hate towards Carl. What does she get? A skill, a potion, where once quaffed, such a great word, she can track any crawler. So she can literally be like, I want to know where Carl is at any time. And so he now has a target on his back. And she has her purpose in the dungeon. It's not to get through. It's not to win. It's to kill Carl. It's to punish Carl for what he did. So you're seeing motivations here. Donut is to become the most famous crawler. Does she realize that she kind of has to stay alive to do that? And she needs to buff things up and she needs to read these spells before learning them? No, no that's not important. So I think it's kind of interesting to see that. Uh, I want to see Maggie Mai redeem herself. And K Frito just says, can she? We're not told everything. And again, this is like Matt Dinneman is is like claiming war on media and he's not wrong. In that entire segment that was just to cause outrage and just to be manipulative of emotions and to, you know, cause as much drama as possible. Maggie Myers here going, that's not the whole story. You don't know what happened. But we don't know what happens because she doesn't say it. She's just so angry. So it's like there's so much. KP Dubs, you really got to out me like that. <clears throat> I also skip text boxes. But again, if I was in a dungeon where every day I could die, I would like to think I would read it. And in video games, it's like I get to ask everyone else to figure it out with me. How great is that? <laughs> Team bonding. For ignorance. Uh, Kate says, I love how Carl was just like, eh, whatever. At least they made me well endowed at the snick, but Maestro was losing his mind. That's another good example of living by the likes and dying by the likes. Maestro is kind of like an evil donut. And the fact that he's being eviscerated in the media and humiliated by it when Carl doesn't even care. It immediately puts Carl in higher power over Maestro in that situation, just like real life media. I actually am glad you brought that up, Kate, because it's like Maestro was trying to manipulate oh, nuts. One second. It's the same damn nut, nut too. Almonds. Almonds are trying to kill me. I am claiming war on almonds. Fuck you, almonds. Um, I'm glad you said that because... Maestro has always been in a position where he is manipulating everything. It's his show, his dynamic. He's choosing the guests. He's trying to do the, the, you know, behind door number ones, or he's trying to be the puppet master and pull all the string, strings. And Carl does a 180 on him. Carl flips the script on him, and Maestro doesn't know how to handle that because he's used to being in power and in charge. And the fact that the entire purpose of having Carl there was to belittle him and bring him down... And then yet um, the audience and the power of influence and um, the people he's trying to control have a greater means than him. He can't contain it. So the fact that you're, excuse me, you're right. This has gone bigger than him and he's been made and it's been flipped that he's being dominated by the person that he tried to bring down. Yeah, Maestro is absolutely going to flip out on that. Um, and I do think it's, again, interesting that Carl's just kind of like, oh, what? Like, what am I doing? Have I ever had sex with Maestro? Obviously not. Like, obviously not. But like, huh, 
there you go. It's kind of funny that like Maestro is the one getting fucked literally in this sense. Uh, so he kind of like sees it for what it is. But Maestro is now spinning out of control because he can't contain this narrative. I think that's really, really interesting. And we're loving it because Maestro is a piece of shit. Bartleby says, it's clever and fast paced and scratches that reality show itch so well that you have to stop and remember that the entire situation is a literal apocalypse and the viewers don't care about anything other than an entertaining death. This is literally like, yeah, the gladiator pits. Human life becomes a sport. Um, Lisa also said with the whole story with Maggie Mai and Frank Q, what we do know was given to us out of order. So we really have little understanding of what that all happened, like what, what went through. Terry says the way that the dungeon is run also reminds me of the uh, how the wardens run uh, runs the death race in the film franchise, making Carl Frankenstein. Can you explain that one to me? What's the death race? Death race is a film series where in the future the American uh, economy collapsed. So they use uh, prisoners to run races and they stream it on uh, services and people can pay to give boons to some of the drivers. Uh, and uh, Warden basically, because the views are going down, uh, does stuff like uh, making one of the uh, uh, tokens in the race that will give you shield or weapons access uh, go off as the, the car goes over it. And yeah, it's basically the same principle of, uh, yeah, uh, people pay to see pe uh, people die. Yeah. And uh, the people controlling the race are doing everything to boost the views, in, even if it goes towards the detriment of the, mm. the racers. Academic says it's Hunger Games, it's Battle Royale, it's Red Rising Book One. It's, it, it's, everyone's got too much money. That's what it is. Um, B Rock Vandal says, imagine if Carl and Donut got the trainer that Frank slash Maggie got. So you think that Frank and Maggie also have Mordecai? Oh, plot twist. Um, clever girl, Colleen, you had a really good comment in there. I'd love you to expand about the difference between Carl and Maestro. Carl has lived in the real world. He has real experience with real people, um, whereas Maestro lives in this uh, construct. Um, he's he's a prince, so he hasn't had to deal with uh, the daily grind that Carl's had to face, um, and he's he lives by his views. He's always uh, felt like he's in control. But he's only in control of this um, this construct. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not even a real world. Um, so in that sense, uh, Carl's real world uh, experience kind of gives him the upper hand. Mm. I also think Carl has a, a healthy dose of fear, but he can't be controlled by fear. And I think Maestro weaponizes fear. He puts people in situations going, well, you have to choose who's going to die, you or the person that you love. And that's like a horror scenario, you know? That's like all the Saw movies where you're just like, that's the worst lose-lose ever, but someone's got to, you know, so you got to make the choice. Um, and he kind of like doesn't sort of get sucked in by that level of fear and he's got confidence to be able to dismantle and disrupt that notion of like uh, weaponizing fear in that regard. Yeah, but you're right. Like this guy's a prince. He's got all this money. He just sits on his throne and he's got his tiny little piglets. The fact that they're all like 11 to 15 kind of thing says everything. He's getting them right where he can brainwash and manipulate them, which I think is the scariest kind of person, to be honest. Um, but yeah, the whole situation is awful. Stargirl makes a really great comment though. I'd love to know more about the viewers. Were their worlds already used on the show or are these views getting a lot of good information prior to their world getting selected for this? Um, you're right, Earth had no idea about this game. People of Earth aren't tuning in every single year to learn about what the dungeon is. They're kept in the dark. So with that understanding, it would be that anyone whose world has been obliterated can watch it. But 
if so few people make it through the labyrinth, I mean, the, you know, the levels and Mordecai made it to like level 11 and then got to be a part of the system, where are all these millions and billions of people? How long has this been going for? That's a great question. We found our first little loophole. Who are these people? Or are there dominant species that have the resources and they're part of the, there it is, the, the Borant Company? What's that word? Borant? Valve? Val, tell, no. Uh, academic? Correct me. The syndicate. So you reckon the syndicate's like in charge of like vast galaxies and they've all got the privilege of not being destroyed? Right. I think the syndicate is like the government structure of whatever sort of uh, universe that this is. But Borant, I think they've mentioned them near the beginning of book one, is the company that is running this particular season of the dungeon game. And that's what's really interesting because if they don't hit a quota and if they don't make it entertaining and they don't hit revenue, then it gets taken over by another one. So they're pulling out all the stops. And I think what else is a really frightening thing is that there aren't set rules rules are really flexible it's like hi just checking in with like the newest things in this update and it's like too many people are dying so we're gonna just rush it forward to like have the least amount of time in the rule book as possible so instead of having 10 days you'll have six good luck and it's like that's a huge drastic change, but they're playing with all the variables that are going on. And they're like, oh, we thought that this, um, the way that we leveled this mob would be super easy. Turns out it totally killed 15,000 people in three minutes. Our bad. Um, we're just going to make those changes. And so you're just kind of oh. like, that was 15,000 people that got eliminated because of a little bug or like a tiny little miscalculation that you had. Or the toilets blow you up if you walk in at the wrong time <laughs> that's it and it's like yeah we we lost a few million people to that glitch and you're just like um <laughs> so that's the thing and that i actually kind of appreciated here because it's like we spent all last week talking about how he would fare and the big thing that we really didn't address was just how random and unpredictable um, the flaws of these earlier stages are because they're testing things out for the first time live. Well, also they, it, it reminds me of like the end of the first Hunger Games where it's like for the longest time they, you know, had the rule of like, oh, if two people from the same district survive, both of them are the winners. And then it ends with, oh, nope, sorry, we're no longer going to do that. You two have to kill each other now. And it's like, all right, we're just going to kill each ourselves and you don't have a winner. It's like, eh, okay, never mind. We, we were sending that rule. Because it's it. not entertaining to see our champions just die in front of everybody. Yep. <laughs> so so they make up shit just to make it more entertaining, not because it's fair. Yep. But in this one, it's like if you have no crawlers left and it's level two, that whole dungeon was a huge failure. So, yeah, they're tweaking as they go. But, like, that's just a really unnerving thought that you could open a door and just explode and die. <laughs> and you're like, oh. So you don't even get, there's like nothing fair about this at all. Um, but some of the ways that you can influence the system is that you do, you know, you pay your daddy tax as Donut calls it, where it's like you feed into the clues that you're being given by AI. If you're going to do something that will make good television or will be entertaining, you will be rewarded. But again, it's such a sweet spot. I mean, this is a bit of a segue, but since we're talking about Hunger Games, Jennifer Lawrence's career is such a good example of that. She was so girl next door. She was so lovable. She was so funny, but she was so popular for so long that people turned against her because she was all of a sudden too funny and too likable and too relatable. And that sucks. So let's bring her down. Like people turn. Vaden, your hands up. Yeah, I just want to talk quickly about the, the glitches. Like, it's one of the, I think the part, parts that's most fascinating to me about the book. Yes, it's your the, job. In general. <laughs> yeah, part of it. It's, yeah. It's like, it's pretty, because it like, it's it's really interesting because of, of how the glitches affect the game. Like, we know that the Boeing Corporation is on the cheap side. Like, the, the, they're in massive debt. And the, and the Vulture Corporation was going to, like, come in and, and take their money and take them, all their stuff and repossess them, basically. But because of this, uh, because they, they started this game early and they, uh, and they're, and they're trying to end this game early as well to to get all their money they can and 
you know, pay off their debt so they don't get uh, destroyed. Essentially, like it's a big part of the game. And like you know, you know, they're, they're the cheapness, the the causing of all these bugs that probably result of that. Maybe AI, other stuff. It affects a lot of different parts of the game, and the you know narrative in general. So, so one part it. of that doesn't really make sense though, because it's just been announced that uh, each crawler can't have more than three patrons, but they also said that you can buy patronage with just a, a single credit. So it's like they're trying to make sure that every single crawler will have patronage. But it's like, I think even Odette said, I had something like eight massive pa uh, patrons and that's sort of like more than usual. Um, I'm wondering why they, if Borrent need as much money as possible, why they're limiting, capping the amount of patrons. But basically if you do have patronage, the more money you put into that person, the better the, the loot that they can get. Yeah, I think it's probably one of the situations where it's like, um, like uh, you know, business supply and buying thing where when they when they only allow a cap of three, it creates the massive amount of demand. You know, it's it's, it's not a rarity thing. Like being yes. a sponsor is like an extremely high um, honor, essentially. Or in this case, you know, it's you know it's it's a huge thing for them essentially if they can do it. So they'll willing to pay astronomical amounts of money to be a sponsor. So I think it works out. No, I mean, right. I assume at least you're right. If there's like there's like unlimited amount, it's like yeah, it loses its appeal. But if you can be one of three for any of the patrons. Yeah, it's like you've got to, it's a bidding war, isn't it? Um, and yes, Kate, that was so stupid with Anne Hathaway. She's so lovely. She's so lovely. It's just like people can just turn. It's awful. Like that's why I, I have such a problem with fame. I think fame sucks. I think fame is so dumb. Anyway, uh, Kate also says rules are always responses to something else. So something happened off screen where they had to implement that rule. And in saying that, um, Academic says, they can release the caps whenever they want as well. Um, Game Wizard says also talk shows paying for popular crawlers for their show. So that's why Carl got switched to that Jerry Springer show versus a real talk show. Yeah, it's just money. And that's what Carl's saying. He's like, I was allowed to veto and now I'm not. And now I'm doing this show that I would never want to do. It's like, ugh. Um, KP Dub says also patron, stop calling me. Um, Patron spots go to auction so that they can drive up the price. There you go. So, I mean, the big themes here, greed. Mod, yes. I think one of the reasons that they probably started doing that is because when you're doing a survival show or something where it's like you can vote, the audience can like, in, you know, um, influence what happens in terms of like patrons and stuff in this situation. Producers will evil edit characters. So in this, there's not really that sort of thing, but in reducing patrons it's probably because off screen too many patrons were showing interest in a crawler that they don't want to win they want a certain character to be like the main character yeah. just looking at it from like a survival show standpoint yeah so if say 10 patrons were like oh i want to you know do carl and donut i want them to be my crawlers they're like well we don't want donut and crawler when we want you know, Lucia Ma. Lucia Ma. yeah, or, you know, whoever as the winner. So we have to limit patrons because Carl and Donut are getting too much interest. Too much and help. And they'll be unstoppable. Yeah, they'll be unstoppable and yep. we have to nerf them. So yes. that's the way they're doing that. But now, and also now there's probably like some political things going on with Maestro's family hating Carl now where there's like gonna be political tensions and reasons why, you know, they might change the rule of like lowering caps or upping caps depending on these like backroom deals. So that's the reason, like, cause they do that kind of like evil editing stuff in real life. Like when you look at any kind of show like that, like- I told you the, I told you the thing. Time. So here's the, this is the brutality of reality television. Uh, one of the a big bachelor dude came forward and then spoke about the, you know, the reality behind reality television. And he's like, you go in and the number one goal is to not be the villain. You just want a good edit. That's the thing. And it's like, there's 20 of you and you know that one or two might get bad and like four might get good. And so you just, you're just hoping that you're not bad. And the producers will start planting the seeds. The producers like, how are you going? Who are you liking? Who are you not liking? And you never want to rock the boat. And then the producer will be like, yeah, that Sarah was pretty dodgy doing that thing, don't you think? And without fail, every person will take the bait 
and dump on the person that the producer is bringing forward because it's a them, not me mentality. I would rather it be them and not me. And so when you have a room full of people who are in a sort of survival mode to win in this instance, uh, and they're presented with the out to, to you know, not, not be the one to go, they will all turn. And so that's how villains in reality shows are made. The producers will basically decide, oh, we could probably run an angle with this person. And the way that they get everyone to turn about them is this very harmless question. Oh, that person did something pretty shady, don't you think? Talk about that. Like, yeah, so shady. I can't believe they did that. Why would they even do that? I would never do that, but they did that. So that's why I think reality television is incredibly immoral. I think it's gross, <laughs> just personally. Uh, yeah, and if you don't play along, you don't get screen time. And of course, you know, this whole thing is, if you're on reality TV, it's to gain notoriety, it's to gain an audience, it's to gain fans so that you can try to monetize that. Um, so they're weaponizing people's desire for fame, which I have less empathy for. It's like, if you wanted that, it, it, there was a risk involved, risk it biscuit. Um, but you're right. Colleen, you, that no one's seeing anyone in the dungeon as a real person with real feelings. Uh, Avery says it's like that episode from series one of Doctor Who where people were randomly selected to be part of a game show and to be eliminated was to be evicted from life. Yeah, you would literally get blasted and die. You were eviscerated. Um, and it took a whole new turn as soon as they realized that to be yeah, eliminated was to die and that, that, that game changed real fast. Academic says, honestly, I don't know if Borant likes or hates Carl and Donut. It's so hard to tell from all of their loot slash monsters slash show appearances. Let's talk about that. There have been a, a couple of instances in which Carl has gotten an item or a clue or looped in on something at a bit of a convenient time. But then there's also other times where it's like, it's hilarious that Donut's opened up her 243rd torch and hisses every time uh the fact that carl's entered with no pants and no shoes and the ai is fixated on the shoe uh, the you know the feet stuff and so he's never going to get pants because he keeps complaining about it so they're playing up to those sorts of things but there are little instances where bye colleen where carl or and donut have something kind of get in the right place at the right time to move ahead. But then there's also times where was Jack a plant to wipe him out? Was, um, you know, you just don't know. Like you don't know how much is oh, at play here. With Frank and Maggie, yeah, the trainer did that on purpose where the, their trainer was totally giving them totally different rules than Mordecai where it was like, you have to kill other crawlers. Like you have to, is what the trainer said to them. So they thought that's how they survived. And it's like a little different than when you're just playing like an online game, when your life is at stake, like what else are you supposed to do, but believe these people, right? Like you die. So the fact that they're purposely giving crawlers different rules because it creates drama mm -hmm. and it's ruining, like it's ruining their lives because look at what's, what happened to Frank and Maggie. like. You can tell that Maggie is just like Frank is a shell of a person, and Maggie now is only being run by vengeance towards yes. Carl. Yeah. That so it's like that is a purposeful choice. Again, it's like an evil editing thing, but it's like now we've created because we need villains that aren't the monsters. We need human villains. Yeah, because but Maggie's monster... interesting. Maggie's interesting because she's got a vengeance plot on Carl, and that's fascinating as a viewer. Frank, who can't string a sentence together, who's looking off into the abyss. It's not interesting TV. That's it's not, not good TV. TV. So what are they going to do? He's already lost a hand. What else are they going to take yeah. from this guy to try and get him back in the game? Yeah, like I was like I was about to say, like monsters don't make good villains. They're just monsters. You know what I mean? Like you, to be a villain, you have to essentially have a speaking part. You know what I mean? Yep. Yep. I feel like there's the, it's kind of difficult to know if this is Bart being the mastermind producers and trying to sow conflict and how much of this is so to speak human uh failures right because as far as we know um frank and maggie's trainer they are 
another former crawler that that's just trying to make it through another season right mm -hmm. like and so they they could be like okay this is how i made it to level 11 or whatever they were able to get off so that they could exist still to this day and and um yeah like be a trainer and be alive right so it's really difficult to know like if that was their honest to goodness like this is how you do it this is how i did it so i'm going to tell you how, how you should do it right so it's it's difficult and kp dubs you had a really good comment that leads into that as well like if you're brand new and you don't know anything about the world talk me through your comment kp dubs because it's 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 that it's that well it's just so if a newborn baby growing up whatever mom and dad tell them that's what they know until they hear otherwise how could they even conceive of questioning that there was something different of you're thrown into this thing the rules of earth have changed the aliens are now telling you this is how life is you're gonna believe it so yeah now and and to follow up on academics thought um it mentioned that each season of the crawl is different and there are different types of dungeons so maybe frank and maggie's trainer came from a different kind of dungeon where you did have to kill other crawlers it couldn't it may not even be nefarious it may just be like that's all that person knows so it, it all kind of goes into a lot of background that we just don't know yet that's it because we and and maggie said exactly that you don't know you don't know so what if their trainer said you know what it is survival. You need to win this. And at the moment with level one, the fastest way to level up is to kill other people. You can get their clothes, you can get their stuff. That's where like the most man of loot is. Who are you to be like, ah, oh, that doesn't really sound ethically good. It's like, do I have to do that to survive? I don't like the sound of it. And the, their, their um, guild trainer could even be like, also your kid, that's gonna be a liability. Anything happens to the kid, take the kid out. You know, we just don't know what, what kind of conversations been shared and like, you know, what they think that they need to do because, uh, yeah, the your trainer has a lot of influence and so whatever their style is, that's what you would be inclined to listen to, academic. Yeah, I feel like, yeah, like as a parent, I, I can, I'm assuming a lot of parents, they're like, you have your daughter with you. And if your trainer says the only way to survive this is to kill other people to get stronger. You got a waffle totally, house. Yeah, you got to do it, right? Like, so I, I can see why they went that path. Now, I'm not sure about this killing of the daughter thing. If that's their motivation, like, and the fact that she says that there's more to the story, there's probably means that there's more to the story there. Yeah. So I'm going to keep reading I want to see what's happening. Hold on. I said you go to the Waffle House if the trainer says to kill your child. If I was a parent, I wouldn't ki I wouldn't be like, that's a great idea. This one? Should I should just get rid of it? Done. Consider it done. I'd be like, nope, I'm going to go to Waffle House and my dog and I are going to eat all you can eat, bacon and deliciouses, and we're going to get squashed together. There's, that's how we go out because I will never do that to my girl. They even said, oh, so bad, because she had to go under anesthesia. They're like, we have to ask the question, if anything happens, would you like us to perform CPR on the dog? And I was like, yes. And like, we just have to ask. I'm like, she's seven. She's only seven. What am I going to be like? Well, that was a good run, but eh, it happens. I'm like, G <laughs> they're like, we just have, we have to ask. There's no right or wrong answer. I'm like, I'm pretty sure there is, actually. Like, <laughs> don't kill my dog. Don't kill my dog. Yes, Aaron. I'm getting ranty. Uh, <laughs> so to kind of follow up on the whole, like, you know, differences between trainers, also the fact that Frank and Maggie's trainers didn't warn them about the consequences of, of the safety rooms. Yeah. Where, like, Carl knew right away from Mordecai. It's like, you can't, especially, you know, in his own, you know, in the training guild hall that he's in. It's like, you can't attack me because you'll just get warped out. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the safe room, you get frozen and you get three strikes and then you get major consequences if you keep doing that it's like <laughs> yeah like what 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 were you like asking your trainer because like carl asked a bunch of really good questions about like basically how to play this game what's the you know safe places what can you do what can't you do he's finding out the limitations yes. here find out your boundaries how far can you go whereas frank and maggie are like oh i just gotta kill people okay fine i gotta survive <laughs> well we know that they're expert liars and deception it's like that whole yeah. thing that went down in the safe room the 
swift and unblinking way that he went into this lie that seemed incredibly believable so you're like ah cool and, these guys survived by deceit and and also it's like carl noticing him doing the whole little finger thing with his own keypad thing where it's like i guess he didn't learn to you can just think it that's it you also, have to ask like, these questions yeah also donut just always speaking in all caps even though she knows damn well you don't have to do it that oh, way she that just does be it because it pisses carl off it would be so infuriating <laughs> hello carl <laughs> um <laughs> but that's a really good thing like it's it's also how much are you learning how yeah it's like you're finding ways flaws in the system i actually don't know if i I'd probably be like, what do I have to do? But I wouldn't think outside the box so well. And I think that what this book does a really good job of now that we have two levels is Mordecai saying, hey, dude, now that you've done the first one, I can say this, look for the hints. There's always going to be clues. And so he unlocked that thought pattern for Carl to try and see things for more than they are. So by the time he gets to the crack Karen that has like those sepsis and taint and huge debuffs, he's made the smoothie of the moonshine and the goddamn miniature Karen. Oh, the way he had to put her in the, the smoothie container and like break her little shoulders to fit her in there so he could blend her up. I was like, that's, I was walking around again in the neighborhood with my girl, my dog. And I'd be like, if I had to chug that back and there's like a little shoe and a leg sticking out of it, I'd be like, and, this is where I die. And, and also finding out all of the, the monsters, you know, the mobs and stuff like that, like they're basically real people. They're like, they're kind of like, partially pre-programmed at least the sentient ones like they all have things that they they're like deathly afraid of the crawlers because like i constantly am fear for my life because they're going to come after me to kill me because i have resources they'd want yep and and all that so it's like all i want to do is just survive long enough to get to the next four because then i can have a better life there yeah <laughs> yeah um oh i was going to say something on that but i sorry <laughs> no it's all right but you're on the yeah you're exactly on the right path where it's path where it's like everyone's just trying to survive Everyone's oh, that's what I was going to say. Uh, it's interesting that like when they, because of their trope, they're the Karens and they're like, I want to speak to the manager. But, it's like, but they are the manager. Um, they started calling out for Craig, was it? Who was that? Was it Craig? It was a name. Nathan. I think it started with a D. It was Damien. 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 Oh, that's actually quite a good play as well. Um, where's Damien? Where's Damien? And so, of course, it's like, Carl's like, hey, what is this? I heard them say this. Like, now that it's been said, you need to explain it to me. Uh, Damien is the, the the level creator. So he's the one who's been, like, putting together. He's the mastermind. He's the guy who's got the moustache and facial hair in Hunger Games, you know, the game designer. Um, and so it's so funny that they felt like they were being wronged, and so they tried to call up the next level person to sort out this issue because they take offense to what's been happening. Um, yeah, Damien, I think that's really quite interesting um the devil the devil ah oh, rope panda's in the house just gifted five subs to brenma oh my josh jimmy yo max dowell ryan berry you all just got gifted a sub one of them was my friend josh are you watching if so say hi happy dubs what are you doing you're adding on on that as well yeah <laughs> i can see live time you're like <laughs> uh bio total rastalin ghost of chris tianma and dre tonks for B, I'll just go gifted a sub. Guys, if you go gifted a sub, make sure you thank the person who gifted it to you. We are nice people in this community. Um, Avery says, working frontline in the customer is always right culture, but like worse. Yes. Um, B Rock Vandals just gifted five subs. Thank you so much. K Frito got one. K Frito, you better say thank you. I know you're there. Uh, Tia Sean Swayze. Penguin Queen, 2016. Uh, Mario Dak. And they four, you got gifted subs. Thank you, B-Rock Vandal. I appreciate that. Hold on, there's one more. K Frito, Lone Star, 278. I don't know why that doesn't show up in that column. That's okay. Kate says, the customer is always right. I've never met a group of people who were more wrong. Again, they're just like weaponizing loopholes. I'm right. And it's like, no, you're determined. There's a difference. Mm. And the stupid thing is like, that's not even the real quote. <laughs> it's the customer is always right in matters of taste. As in, if you want to buy an ugly ass hat, go for it. Nobody's going to stop you. Mm. But if you're also going to then buy it and say, no, I want my money back. It's like, no, you yeah. bought it. It's yours. 
go away. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Got it. Oh, it's and then of course we had the gym bro earlier. It's just funny. Like and then we got the gerbil. Um, this is something that again, I think I don't know if the AI is playing at it, where we are seeing Carl and compassion. Uh, Carl's showing the maestro trying to save the two other contendants and like giving them a hint and like trying to override maestro's rules. We're seeing that he's looking out for other people. Um, and with Mordecai saying there's always clues, they go, these, it's dingo nation time. And I will say that Jeff Hayes did a really good Australian accent. And I cannot believe I'm saying that. His Australian accent in that moment was pretty good. I was like, this guy is amazing. Um, but it, okay, so it's like a two, it's a two way thing. Um, they go into this open sort of like cage fight area with these dingoes. And there's a lot of very wounded dingoes that are in locked cages. Now, the things that we know going into this, Carl is compassionate and wants to help others. Donut hates dogs. And so there's dogs riding dogs. And so she's just like, ah! But in this instance, you have to help the dogs who will then help you in the boss battle. So it's quite interesting to see Carl be like, I want to try something. I'm going to give him a pet treat. She's like, that is the, gre the, the greatest of all sins or something like so extreme because she doesn't want to help them. And so that then changes the effects of what happens in the boss battle because they get all the dingoes on their side who then help fight. And I just think these are the little tweaks that we're seeing where AI has a bit of a say in it. Yes, Aaron. But she was okay when she gets the, basically the, the zombie spell where it's like he convinces her, it's like, this is what you can do with a spell. You can get the dingoes, you know, to resurrect, fight other dingoes, and then resurrect them to fight more dingoes. Like, this is the greatest spell ever. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's such a good moment. It's so funny. Uh, Kate says, the biggest mystery I want to know, who is Ferdinand? Do you want me to spoil it for you? Okay, you'll find out soon. You will find out. That is a dangled little carrot. Um, academic says, Carl's not an asshole and they will not break him. They will not break him. Um, Kate says, also for the next week, are we reading all of book two or just the first half? I kind of put it to you guys, if you needed another halfway breather for the book or if it's just gonna be easy now that we're in the mindset, now that we know what Dungeon Crawler Carl's all about, do we just want to read through it, have a week off, and then reconvene with the whole book? Read all the way through instead of having a halfway point again. I just figured because we've got Matt afterwards. I mean, five nights every single every single Wednesday, Wednesday or Thursday of this month is, is not a bad thing. But I could do a gaming stream instead. I actually think I would rather just not be stopped. I don't half the group are not stopping anyway, so like they cannot stop. They will not stop. So I don't want to have to get people to stop. So let's do whole book. Let's do the whole book. Everyone read all of book two. And then on the 23rd, we'll talk about that whole thing. Lisa says, I don't carry the way. Bartleby says, this is also kind of a gaming stream. Academic says, you will not stop me. KB Dubs says, I can stop and I did stop. Gold star, new achievement. KB Dubs, you've got the brown nose. <laughs> You, you managed to do what teacher said perfectly. Everyone else, you suck. Terry says, Maud really, really wants to play Baldur's Gate. Dude, I have played like another 12 hours after that first stream. I have played that game. And I realized I've like fucked up a lot. So I almost need to play and then replay it again because somehow I do not have a druid on my team. He will not join me because I didn't defeat the three goblin leaders because I was too, I was not powerful enough to do it yet. And then I, I, I messed up. I messed up. Do what teacher says, not what teacher does. <laughs> Is Gail dead? He may as well be. Oh my God. Oh, I just have this like kind of little thing where I tried to kill a godling. And so now I have to like absorb artifacts and I'm not collecting any of the artifacts. You have to get all your good stuff and then I'll drain it. Uh, don't even worry about it. I'm like, fuck you, Gail. Fuck you, Gail. But that actually just reminded me, so that Sword Art Online, you know, anime I was mentioning earlier, you said you saw, there is a parody uh, show on YouTube where somebody basically redubs it as a comedy thing. And they made the joke with uh, the main girl, Asuna, 
that she can't open her menu in that first season for like oh. the first year or something like that it's like how it's like how have you survived for like months on end it's like you can't do anything in this game without opening the menu it's like imagine that with like the dungeon crawler it's like like with agatha it's like you never went through the tutorial you can't open your menu agatha. you can't do any of that stuff yeah well i think she's a spy for we need company. to talk about like, agatha yeah i've got my notes yes. about it okay <laughs> agatha's shopping cart to get from level one to level two Carl just grabs it and puts it in his inventory to get everyone out. So he's got the shopping cart. She's freaking out. She's freaking out. You're a thief. You just took everything. I want it back. She's leaving the group. As soon as she got to level two, she's gone. Did she make it? We don't know. Where's Agatha? Not sure. She was reckless in the first one. She's a cackling bat. Um, she's not with like, wasn't really with the people, but she caused a fire to get everyone out of the building. And then... Carl discovers that if you click a little icon, it will put all of your items into most valuable to least valuable. And all of a sudden there are these items that he doesn't remember getting that are extremely valuable. And they are Valtech Corporation guns. There's like some sort of, what's the gun? It's like a, a ray gun or like a- Pulse rifle or- Pulse, pulse rifle, plasma, plasma rifle, yeah. something like that. There's a, what else is there? There's a Valtech- yeah. Communication device. This weird Mag. communication yeah. device. Mag 3040 Valtech corporate pulse pistol. The Valtech <laughs> Perso Shield Platinum Edition. Hands Tunnel 7C Operator Relay by Valtor. So- She's a, she's a spy. She's a Valtech is, spy. Very high level, powerful items. And what's the communicator? And, Who's she communicating with? And also, none of the the uh, NPCs or whatever can see her. It's like, especially when she was like, you know, talking with Carl on like the stairwell to the third floor. It's like, uh, uh, what's her name? The the PR lady like comes. It's like I couldn't see you for a second. It's like because like, it a few glitched minutes. out. Like, yeah, you glitch out. I couldn't see you on the thing. It's like. She's clearly a spy. <laughs> yeah, she's edited out of the playbacks as well. So is it Brandon? Yep. Brandon said, um, I, I was there. She was next to me. But when we watched it back, she wasn't there. So she's being edited out of footage. She doesn't exist in the game. She's got really high level equipment. She was the one who caused a lot of people to exit a building when the level opened up. She's got enemy opposing comp competitive companies high-tech gear theories who's agatha what's her deal i think she's there to cause disruptions in the game so that it looks bad for the boring company <laughs> yeah i was about to say she's like almost like a repo man where she's in there like because their um her company is essentially waiting out just outside the solar system of the boring company waiting for you know them to essentially come out of their house so they can break their legs and take she, their money she's trying to basically devalue the stock mm. for this. Yeah, company. so she can kind of like look at the game, which is Borat's only asset right now that's saving them for bankruptcy. She's essentially inside the asset right now. So she's probably some sort of like, you know, space accountant, repo man <laughs> kind of thing. Um, Sev isn't even an NPC, says academic. Sev is from, she's a, what do they call them? the type of race. Uh, I only hear it, so I can't see it. So I find it harder. Yeah, what a are A guillotine. A guillotine? Uh, yeah, I think it's a guillotine, I think, yeah. Can someone, can someone write out how to spell it and say it? The two fish tall people, yeah. And she comes in with like full on armor because she's like, I don't know what to expect. It's like, it's like a diving bell suit or something like yeah. that. That's what they described it. Guillotine, <laughs> that's it. I was thinking it was felt like a guillotine or something. I thought there was a few L's in there that we're not saying. I had a whole other understanding because I've only ever heard it said. Guillotine. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly what I thought, academic. That's exactly what I thought it would be called. <laughs> Kua tin. You know a quick, quick, before we get off of it, I think Agatha's whole goal is to make the game go on as long as possible. And maybe, like, going a little bit even further back, like, some of the reasons why Carl and Donut have gotten their the benefits that they have gotten, maybe indirectly because of Agatha, or maybe even directly because of Agatha. And if the goal is to bankrupt um, oh. 
abhorrent, then the longer the game goes on and the further that the crawlers get, the worse the have to pay out. I right? actually, oh. I actually forgot. Like, what, what did they? Was like the winner get? Like, they get to control the planet, isn't it? Like, the winner gets to control everything. They like the people who want to mine it can't mine anymore because the crawler won the game. Yeah, isn't so that the what... crawler that wins uh, gets the planet back so... to do whatever they want with it. Well, so if there's nothing left. So so if nobody wins, it means the boring company owns the planet, they get the resources, and they also get the money for the game. Yes. There may be something to what you said about making the game last longer because each level yeah. takes more days to complete. And more last, resources to do. Mm. The last three or four levels might take as long as the ten levels before that. So like you get to level 13, 14, 15... You're there you for months. 20, 20, 25, 30, 40 days on that level. That's just like in D&D &D or yeah. other RPGs. It's like the first five levels are pretty quick in terms of experience points. Yeah. But then once you're starting to get into the higher levels, it's like higher all grinding. the other levels combined. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they want to get them down earlier, quicker. Or that's why she's stalling. Oh. Uh, KP Dubs, you also said, is Agatha sabotaging? She could have easily shot Carl in the back a couple of times. She's not taking yeah, him just, out. Kind of continue what we were just saying. Like, instead of maybe trying to sabotage the company by eating up the game, she could be sabotaging it by lengthening the game, by making... Um, yeah. So long. If every crawler dies before level 8, the game's over quick and Borant gets their money. Maybe it's low ratings, but maybe it's enough money for what they need. If the game goes on too much, maybe they don't get paid in time. I don't know how that works. They're, they're trying to maximize their stock, basically. It's it's a stock market game. <laughs> yeah, so it's like Agatha's not really, like, their friends. And, like, someone was saying it's like, didn't Brandon know Agatha? Yeah, but, like, they've all been here for a long time preparing for this. So Agatha probably was here before the collapse preparing because Borat was preparing. Like, more like I was here um, in the 30s. Yeah. yeah, so I think um and in Blockbuster. Agatha's Agatha's almost like the end of me of my enemy is my friend, where she's kind of working on the side of the crawlers because then lengthening the game ruins Borat's plan. Borat, sorry, Borat. Uh, <laughs> Very nice. Hammocks. They're all the dungeon boys wearing banana hammocks. Uh, <laughs> but uh yeah, so she's like helping them because it serves in the interest of her bosses. Mm. I can just imagine Carl Gain that in a loot box is a banana hammock. <laughs> God damn it. Um, well, he still wouldn't have pants on. Exactly. That's why I think he would get it. <laughs> he would put it over his new love heart boxer shorts. Um, okay, so the big thing happening, we're wrapping things up. The big thing going into level three is that they get to choose their class and race. Now, this is like, if you got the elderly down, do they then get to assume a new body? Do they then, then get to change and not be old and they can, is that why they just have to get to the first two levels? Um, I... Carl's deciding he wants to stay, stay human. Odette told Donut, a cat's got to stay a cat. What kind of changes do you think will happen? I want predictions I for people that don't know. So Terry, shush. I don't think the elderly will like be even if they change like their physical body. I think like their mental, you know, whatever like detriments they have is probably still going to be there because I think they like Mordecai says like you know yeah their bodies can heal up from all whatever things that are physically wrong with them, but every mental malady is still there. So they still have Alzheimer's or dementia or whatever. Kate, you made so. a good point. Yeah, like, well, we don't know the rules yet, so it's hard to say, but if you chose a long-lived race, like an elf or a dwarf or whatever in this world, that a 90-year-old elf is a lot different than a 90-year-old human. So if you chose an elf, would you stay the same age or would you become whatever the equivalent in an elf is to a 90-year-old? Like, would you become like 3,000 years old? Mm, we don't know yet. Baldry Prime's got an Agatha... Um theory uh says i took her as a legacy bit of code the whole game's run so poorly that maybe she's been stuck in it and is either intentionally causing chaos for a purpose or out of nihilism agatha's stuck in the game uh but yeah she was outside 
uh, causing a fire to get people out of the hospital uh, or the, the elderly center. Academic says it seems like all the crawlers that last through the dungeon seem to get long lives, no? Odette was in one so long ago. Um, Mordecai's been in one for ages. And the fact that like that little bit of information that Odette dropped and that's if Mordecai doesn't get someone to a certain level, then he doesn't get, this doesn't count towards his sort of debt in his agreement. And it's not that he has to wait for the next uh, dungeon. He has to wait for the next Borant dungeon, which could be seven or eight dungeons time. And it's like they they spend decades preparing for each of these dungeons. So how long is this? There is a sense of immortality if you go through long enough. Odette's climbed the ladder and someone said earlier, Odette doesn't even have legs. She's got a carapace. She's got like, you know, a body of, of legs because like when she was in the dungeon, she lost her legs, but because she had such high profile and powerful patrons, they sent her this ability that if you kill something, you can attach their legs to it. And that's still in effect for her. In fact, it's most Lieutenant of her body is of the crawl. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so anyway, read the rest of the book. We're going to have a week. Hold on. What's next week? No, I think we're going to do it. I have to do it. No, we're doing book club. We have to. I got a little cool sponsored thing after it. I'm going to talk about uh, some of the cool books that are being made into film and TV. Mm. So we're coming back for book club, everyone. You don't have to stop. <laughs> we could read the whole book and just do it next week and then take the week after off. And then we have Matt on on the 30th. Or add book three. Or we read book, yeah, book three before I, Matt. <laughs> I, I wouldn't be able to do that. <laughs> uh, we, we've we redone that five. schedule way too many times, guys. <laughs> I know. That's this is what happens when Maud's I, at the helm. I'm I, like, what about that, though? I, I, I would have to get to the last week. Unfortunately, I wouldn't be able to get through the halfway point in time. <laughs> so we are going to be doing Dungeon Crawler, Kyle, next week. Do we think we're going to do the whole book or nah? As much as the book as possible? We just split it up. We'll just split it up. We'll just split it up. Next week's going to be uh, a, yeah, a little bit different because I'm going to be talking about books that are being made into film and TV, which is going to be really cool. So we'll do half of the second book for next week. Oh my God, I can feel Tass being like, what are we doing? <laughs> I'm like, ah. So on Thursdays or Wednesday? Back to Next Wednesday. Wednesday. Next Wednesday. 17th. No, 16th. 16th. It's the 16th. What did I put in this damn email? There is now a contract, everyone. Um, what did I write? Fuck, I said 17th. Why? Oh my God, I suck. It's next Thursday. Test, wow. test run for CO Thursdays, I guess. <laughs> uh, my, ma my manager's been messaging me this entire time as well. Also stream <laughs> next Wednesday. Ah, uh, cool. Uh, I'm going to keep you all on your toes. Read half the book by next week. <laughs> Chapter 13? Sure. I trust you. Stop at, Stop at the end of 12. Stop at the end of 12? Is there a different part one, part two, part three, part four at all? Not that one. Ah, there's 26 there's chapters? Like 25 plus the epilogue. Okay. Stop at 13. Stop at 13. Oh, yes, Avery. Speaking of books being turned into movies, I've got to go watch Red, White, and Royal Blue when we're done here. Ooh, ooh. Um, okay, I've got to do a little bit of cleanup because I've given the wrong date. Uh, this is what happens when I get distracted when I text and I don't have uh, a, a solid idea in front of me, but I fucked up. I'm going to try and write it. We're going to aim for Wednesday. It could be Thursday, so, but we're going to aim for Wednesday. I'm going to try and make that happen. <laughs> it's now my manager's problem and not my problem. Um, Contract signed, if you forfeit, your souls will be taken. Yeah, cool, cool, cool. Welcome to the entertainment industry. <laughs> what soul? Um, and is that Way of the Kings on my shelf back here? Yes, we're doing it in, when is that, November? 
No, we push it to next year. We push it to next year. We're doing it next year. We're taking on Red Rising and Dungeon Crawler Carl this year. We're doing Way of the Kings. When's Thursday? <laughs> Fourth Wing is uh, November. Fourth Wing September. November, is it? Or no? No, it's September. September. Yeah. yeah. Next month's Fourth Wing. October's going to be a spooky Stephen King fairy tale book. Right. Nice. November Thing. is light or not light bringer uh, iron gold. Iron gold. And Just... I think it's the next three and four of dungeon of dungeon crawler. Yeah. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Where we're going, we don't need scheduled. <laughs> How many times have we changed it, Lisa? It's like, and now it's this, and I'm like, oh, but what about uh, that? at least five? I think at least five. <laughs> I feel like we could three, do six three, before three the card Monty. Your schedule, basically, where where is it going? <laughs> yeah, so we're doing. We're absolutely meeting next week. Read half of book two for Dungeon Crawler Carl, the Doomsday scenario. Um, we can do after that, which will be the twenty third, and Matt's going to be on for the thirtieth, and we should have a competition going around that time as well. So yay! Thanks, everyone. Sorry that things are always in a bit of a tizzy. Welcome to my life. Welcome to my brain. It's not a fun place to be sometimes, but we do what we can. Uh, Members Plus, we're going to hang out afterwards. And Tass, I apologize. I am sorry. I have to tell you what was happening. Uh, but apart from that, let's go raid. Uh, I think since we've been talking about Baldur's Gate, we should raid some Baldur's Gate. Um, who's playing it? Da, 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 da. This should be fun. Anthony Carboni is playing Baldur's Gate. He's a hoot. Um, everyone stick around. Make sure you drop some books in his stream. It looks like it's kind of just started maybe. Uh, and I'm going to be playing more Baldur's Gate as well. Good night, everyone. Tass, are you there? <laughs>